Welcome to the Victor Frankel Meaning Academy. I am Dr. Baruch Levy, also known as B. I am in my virtual studio as he has a beautiful backdrop behind him. The one and only <laughs> Dr. Daniel Franz. Dr. Dan, what's happening? Not much, as you can see, B. Yeah, it's a beautiful fall day out here in Farmville, but, uh, you know, I figured I would enjoy it. And as you know, the, the internet out in Farmville doesn't always want to work. So I decided to, to bring it to the phone and bring it out side and for those if anybody gets to watch the video if the video comes through you know, they can see the uh dr dan external studios so we can get a little yeah there we go the dr dan external barn studio for those of you who wanted to know well it doesn't bode well for the great state of indiana technologically but it sure is beautiful so at least you got that well thank you yeah, I'll tell you, I was just, uh, it really is a treat for me personally when I uh, look to my phone and see that magical 5G sign on it. It doesn't happen often, but oh, man, I'll tell you, it really, it really makes my day. Unfortunately, not going to happen today. So, but we have, we have really important things to talk about anyway. Hopefully it comes through loud and clear to those who are listening. Absolutely. Let's get into our meaning conversation as we always do do. We'll see where the nuos, where the spirit takes us. But at least we'll start um, from the from the beginning point of this journey of the defiant power of the human spirit, Viktor Frankl talks about, is the center of who we are. And there comes a time in life or times in life when we have to make a defiant stand. You know, Dr. Frankl talks about making a stand. And I think of the word decision, decide, coming from the word incise or incision, right? To cut off. And there just comes these moments in life where you must make a stand, you must cut off sort of retreat or cut off indecision or cut off any more speculation and just sort of plant your feet on the ground. And that's true in all aspects of our life, but especially I think in this kind of second half of life, midlife and onwards, when you're running families, running businesses, running, you know, all kinds of organizations and people need us, people need you to really make a stand in life. What do, what do we do with that, Dr. D? I think it's ironic that, you know, this phase in life, as you, as you highlighted, it really does seem to be all about running, a lot of running, running here to there, running businesses, running families, managing stuff. And Hopefully we are, <clears throat> excuse me, running to and not running from. And I think uh, Dr. Frankel talks about that. As we prepared for today, I was really looking at something you had mentioned. Uh, I know a group you're working with is talking about the idea of how to move uh, men specifically from prince to king. And that comes right out of some Jungian archetypes, right? The king, warrior, and ma magician and lover of the male archetype. And, and that's one we seem to be missing today. We are not taking a defiant stand and growing from prince to king. But too many of us seem stuck in our princely, childish ways and not moving forward. And, and I think it is time to, to call men, especially men of, of business, men who have companies or are running companies or leaders in companies, by making this transition, by taking this defiant spirit, by transitioning from prince to king, you can have an impact on, I know we talked about it last week with Dr. Elise, you can have an impact on so many others, such a powerful and positive impact. Yeah, let's flesh out a little bit this prince versus king. You know, prince, at least developmentally, is, I think of it as sort of a, well, you know, then another image, which also comes from Jungian teachers, is there's a page, a knight, a prince, and a king. You know, page is childhood. It's that pre-knight. Knight is like adolescence into your 20s. And then, you know, that settling in period where you're not settled, but you're settling in. You're, you're taking a spouse. You're raising, a, having a child. You're, you're building a profession. That's that prince dumb. And, you know, maybe we call it like mid-20s to a 40-ish period, 40 late 30s to early 50s, <coughs> excuse me. And then that's the end of the line unless you make a choice, right? This king piece is a choice where these others mm -hmm. almost aren't a choice. Maybe it's a choice from knight to prince, excuse me. But it's not a, but it is absolutely a choice to go from prince to king. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, it's interesting. So uh, we've bridged 
Franklin psychology to Jungian psychology. And now we'll just go with straight up developmental psychology in that, yeah, that's that phase of life where, where I, I, you, you might be a little older than me, B, not by much, but, uh, you know, where we, we start to look at how we're going to give back. We, we transition from running, um, from creating our career, our job and our family to transitioning to giving back within it. Um, society expects us to be solidifying our role in those things and then what and 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 i think that then what is what you and i deal with a lot in people we work with the then what you don't make a choice in the then what you stay in that princely state you stay a child if you choose to develop into that kingly majestic giving back that kind of you know king is regal and authoritarian not necessarily authoritative and, and works with people to give back and see them from their best beautiful picture that could be, but we need more guys doing it. Yeah. that that shift is um, what Frankel calls self to self transcendent, right? And there's this transcendent component and it still implies that you have a strong sense of self, but there's something, well, you, you said it, you're, you're running towards, there's something bigger you're working to, Mm-hmm. You're it's no longer about you. You know, when, when I look, I've been a prince. I was a prince for a long time. And as much as I'd like to say I was working for my family, there was a lot of me building my my profession, my my skill set, my mastery, my bank account. Yes, absolutely. So that it would positively impact the world around me. But I can't describe it. But there was an empirical shift when I hit this sort of next chapter, which is king, which is really it's not about me. And and I think that's tied to this. It's hard to get to a king place before a certain chronological time, like a lot of factors. But you, I don't think you can really hit it before your 40s. I agree. And I think it's interesting. I think not only is it chronological, but I think sometimes crisis or suffering oriented. We need that. Uh, well, that crisis for many boy, for many men. Um, what do we joke about? We call it the midlife crisis, the sports car, the, the the attractive younger secretary that makes us feel better about ourselves or sometimes crosses boundaries, right? That that crisis, or it could be a, a physical a health crisis or a family crisis or something pulls us toward being better if we choose or if not, we, we fade away. We, we, you know, again, stay the prince. We, we stay stop giving back and we stay stuck in that process of you know only us living for us i can remember that time as well i I would use the excuse oh no i'm doing it for the family overworking trying to make more do more commit more and you know at those times it was about me until i had to realize until i faced that crisis of no no it's not about me there's a sticker actually right here on my laptop it says your life is not about you And in so many ways, that's true. It's, you know, if, if you intend to live it meaningfully, and we could take a long time to describe that, but if you intend to live it meaningfully, it's not about you. It's about self-transcendence. It's about serving others. And in doing that, you grow, you become better, but it's about taking care of others. And again, I, I don't know, I, I didn't intend, I don't know if you did, I don't think we intended for today's episode to be kind of calling out to men specifically and men of a, of a certain position in life. But I think that, that's where we are. Well, it, it's calling out men, but you know, I did a podcast a few weeks ago on being a king, and I got two or three responses from women who were talking to me about their kings or their princes that they wish were kings. So, you know, these were queens who were waiting for their king to show up in the form of their husband. And so, I think, regardless of if men or women watching, everybody benefits when a man shifts from prince to king. Um, so a couple of things you said. One is, um, you know, you described the the proverbial midlife crisis as a sports car and the trophy wife or whatever that you know ridiculous caricature might be. That's not the crisis. That's the reaction. The crisis is mm-hmm. feeling your mortality, right? Which is that's why it happens forties, fifties, because I think for the first time a man can finally feel. I think a person in general, when we're talking about men, could feel his clock ticking. This is real. This this thing, I'm going to die. Like 
and did I get all my needs met? Have I fulfilled all of my desires and hopes and whatever? And so that's a very piss poor reaction. But I do think that that's where it's coming from. So the call of that is good. The reaction to it, not so good. Well, and, and I think the, the questions you just asked are the parts that are not so good. Did I get my meet needs met? Did I do what I wanted? I, 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 I. We live in a world with too many eyes, too many thinking of people thinking about I and not taking care of we, not taking care of us. I think that's why we see you know so many broken homes and divorce rates and, and all that kind of stuff. But Yes, when that crisis comes, now wait a second, B, this is groundbreaking. I don't think we've ever approached this before, but you mean we're going to die? This isn't going on forever? Newsflash, I know. No matter how much tofu you eat, you'll Yeah, newsflash. Um, <laughs> no matter exactly and i think we face that you know many many people face that like you said 40s and 50s we lose our first parent or we start to recognize maybe you know we're the last of a generation and all those kinds of critical moments those crises that when we choose to to allow them to integrate them to allow them to become part of our lives we get better when we avoid them, attempt to escape through sports cars or secretaries or substance use, well, we become diminished. So this 40s, you know, Jung said it was 40. I think that's a great, like, stake in the ground, but I don't, obviously it's not a hard and fast rule for everybody, but there's a 40-ish thing that happens. You have, as, as a person, as a man in particular, I think you have the first opportunity to realize you know what frankel said man is not free from his conditions and i think we delude ourselves in that princedom in that knighthood certainly well i know i did i how many times did i get in the car with a drunk driver how many times did i you know i was a knight i was invincible how many times did i do stupid <clears throat> things that i probably shouldn't even be here because you know you're invincible and then the prince, you're still, maybe you're not, you know, doing such obviously stupid things, but you think you're going to, oh, I'll have plenty of time for my kids later. That's why I'm going to work so hard now, right? And then you realize like you're not free from your conditions. And that's a humbling experience. But he says, but, but he is free to take a stand in regards to his conditions. So what, what is Frankel doing for us here? Well, I think he's pointing out the idea of choice between stimulus and responses or ability to choose. And, and there's a lot of stimuli during that time as we see our, our children grow. And, and I'm facing a lot of this right now uh, with, with many families and, and professionally, personally, as well as my own. You know, the last child goes off to school and, and you face an empty house and you realize, um, did I do well? Did I do all right? Did, did I do good? Or did I really make a mess out of out of the 18 or or 20 years I had? And, and some of the people I work with are shattered today as they look back and others can look back with. I think the healthy way to look back is, well, there are areas I could have done better, uh, but I did the best I could. Um, and, in, and in that realization is the opportunity to take that into the future and to continue to do the best you can or to continue to try to grow in what the best you can might be. Yeah. And right now in this next chapter with your, with your girls, right. Frankel continues by writing and saying conditions do not completely condition him within limits. It's up to him whether or not he succumbs and surrenders to the conditions. Right. And so in this next chapter, because this is the narcissism that we all engage in, which is too much reflection on what was, I can't change mm. it, right? And then I get mm -hmm. stuck in it and I feel bad. And actually, who am I serving by feeling bad? I'm actually hurting the people around me who are waiting me for to change or to, to stand up to my conditions. And I can't completely change them, but I can, um, I, you know, he says he may rise above them, right? And so going into this next chapter, learning from the mistakes, bearing the burden, as we've talked about, Carrying that forward to do better, not perfect, do better. Agreed. Um, the first, you know, since the, we, we share this with our individual audiences as well as the Meaning Academy audience, my audience knows my affinity for the uh, diagnosis and, and pop culture word narcissism. And uh, so I'm just going to say 
Yes, it doesn't quite fit the diagnostic criteria, B, but it is pretty damn self-serving. Um, it, it's uh, it, it's so sad to watch somebody reminisce, even in a positive way, reminisce in what was 10 or 20 or even 30 years ago, getting stuck in that past of it was so much better then. Well, you can't go back. And if everything was so much better then, then, you know, as, as you've said before, why are you living now? Right. And that's all we have is to live now. We can enjoy the past and look at the pictures Facebook or Google reminds us of what happened eight years ago and, and enjoy that. But we got to live for today and, and look at the past and, and allow it to propel us to be better today. Because to, to not do so is not, not quite narcissistic. It's just selfish. It's just flat out selfish and self-serving. And it's a princely act of selfishness rather than a kingly act of of self-transcendence. So back to this imagery of Prince to King, right? It's much more of a, where do you put your attention? And also, where do I stand? You know, I, I just think of the imagery of a prince is running. A knight is all over the place. A prince is a lot of movement out into the world, right? Pursuing. A king stands still, right? On, on the throne. People come mm. to the king. And I don't mean this in some arrogant way. In fact, I think it's a it's a service to our children, to our, you know, when I when I see men who are at that proverbial cross crisis crossroads midlife and they go running after nightly stuff, they go after the, mm -hmm. they go to the bars again. They go to, you know, back on the dating scene again. They go out into the world to pursue more fun, exotic things. I watch what happens to their family and their kids look at them with a diminished view of the king could have been a king would have been a king but kings honestly aren't that interested in pursuing their own desires at that point and they stay put they stand still so it doesn't so so there's this like movement thing that shifts when you become a king you just stand still and you let people orient themselves around you does that resonate oh absolutely what a beautiful image right the king on his throne with people coming to him and asking him advice King, you've lived such a, a, a noble and, and sacrificial life. What do I do here? How do I do this? You know, when your children come back to you and say, hey, I, I got a question about this, or your friends, when you can have those interactions, or, you know, we're, we're fortunately blessed enough to, to do this every day. I don't know if it makes us kings, but, you know, we provide insight and wisdom when we can on a daily basis. And I think as specifically as men going from prince to king, we are all called to that, to stop, to find out a way to stay still, to allow the stillness to remind us of our experiences. And hopefully those experiences bring wisdom. And if not, we can start seeking wisdom even at an older age. But in the end, especially towards the end, and not to say 40 to 50 is the end, we can still have a robust you know, few more decades. But towards the end, it really is to be whole, to be wholesome, to live meaningfully is to give back in experience, in wisdom, in, in service, in all of these ways. So I just ran a men's group and there was some resistance to what I just said about sort of staking your place in the ground, sitting on your throne, allowing people to orbit around you or orient themselves around you as an act of service. Because these some of the, a couple of the guys said, I'm not perfect. I'm not there. I don't have all the answers. And we ended up in a conversation where that's, it's not, that's not what a good king does. A good king sits still and en engages the conversation and doesn't run. But it doesn't mean you're dispensing, you know, nuggets of wisdom all the time. No, the best kings can reflect the question back. And as you use uh, as you and I know, in, in good psychology and especially good logo therapy, we believe we all have the answers within us, whether it's our friends, our children, our wives, people we consult with. We have the answer within us, in our nuos, in our spirit, in our defiant human spirit. We have the answers. A good king helps somebody bring that answer out. A good king does not dispense wisdom and say, as, as we've joked before, right? Well, what you ought to do is, no, that's not being a good king. That's being a tyrant, right? A good king says, well, let's talk about that. Let's find the solution. 
not let's find my solution. Let's find your solution. Yeah. And so it's really about that imagery of the king on the throne and not as hierarchy, which I know our society has a hard time with, but as a fixed, immovable object, right? A, a sense of certainty mm -hmm. in our uncertain world. And that's that's the role of a queen and a king, each in their respective ways. But we're talking about the king today and that king just sitting still, being present, right? Engaging. You know, I know when I was a prince, I was not as present. I was I was there, but I wasn't there. No, I, I think in that image, it's not just about, it's not about sitting. So I think everything you've said is, is, is fully accurate. But if one of the messages we can get out there is it's about being stable. It's presenting that image of stability to those around you. That person is a rock. That is somebody that I know is going to be there and be present when I need them. That doesn't mean, <laughs> okay, gentlemen, pay attention attention here. It doesn't mean sitting in your recliner in front of the TV, immovable, asking people to serve you, right? It doesn't mean sitting on the other throne next to the bathtub and shower. What it means is, is being consistent, being stable, being present. So those that need you, your queen, your family, your friends, your community, they know where to go to find you. And it better not be in that damn recliner. And it's and it's not geographical, right? You can be traveling the world and mm -hmm. still be present and still be grounded. It's why you're doing it. It's there's not a running from, right? There's a there's an intentionality and a consciousness that comes with this um, presence. Not as not necessarily a physical presence, right? That's not the point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. Here, and I think. Frankel says, ultimately, man is not subject to the conditions that confront him. Rather, these conditions are subject to his decision. Wittingly or unwittingly, he decides whether he will face up or give in, whether or not he will let himself be determined by the conditions. That's the type of presence we're talking about. Yeah, I love that wittingly or unwittingly. And, and I've had to guide a lot of people uh, indiv you know, individually, but also in, in different business consultations, wittingly or unwittingly. Wittingly means you decide, you take an active interest in making a decision of what you do or where you want to go. Unwittingly is saying, eh, you know, I'm just not going to decide. And if you don't decide, life will decide for you. That's, that's giving into the conditions. You don't have to. You can work with them. You can work against them. You can work through them. But you have to choose. And choosing not to choose is still a choice. Thanks, Rush. Yeah. Rock oh, down. come on, man. Really? Was that one of his? I did, I did not know that. I thought I pulled that out uh, on my own. Um, so that's one of the big shifts into King. People have been asking me, how do you define the king? And that is it. It's your conditions no longer define you. You define your conditions. I don't care what it is. It can be financial. It can be marital. It can be relationships. It can be the weather. It can be your health, right? It's no longer the one deciding. I decide. And as Frankel said, maybe the only decision I get to make if my health is taking a downturn and I'm dying of cancer is how I choose to show up and, and meet that and face it and move through it. Absolutely. And I think that's an important statement. How I choose to show up. Do I choose to show up in a stable and present way? Or do I choose to show up flying about all over the place, not paying attention, being ignoring? You know, those around me calling for help, calling for my, my wisdom and experience and, and ability to help them. Well, since your um, internet, internet connection feels like you're on the moon, maybe it's a good place to wrap. But uh, I think we really opened up an important conversation today around this, this shift, this midlife shift that needs to be wittingly right, done, consciously engaged, chosen. You don't just become a king. Whereas I think you do just chronologically become a page, a knight, even into a prince. This last one has to be a choice. 
And these are just some of the, I think, factors that we, we need to think about if we want to make the choice to become a king. Any final uh, ideas or words on, the, on this? Yeah, I, I, I fully agree. I, I think um, some work I'm doing on the side, I want to highlight that definitely relates to this. One of my, one of my big projects right now, besides just the Dr. Dan offices, is a, a program called Purposeful Transition. You can find that at PurposefulTransition.com, where I'm actually working with small business uh, specifically. Um, I, I've worked with small business before. I love small businesses. But I also, you know, have trained for 25 years in family systems and all of those theories. So I want to work specifically with family bits, small family businesses to work on their transitions from prince to king, from owner to retiree. And, and all of these theories, I love how we highlighted them today, are so applicable. And I know, B, you do a lot of work with, with businesses and leadership teams and men in business that... Please don't take this just as, well, that was a fun podcast and I need to become a king. But look at that as where are the areas in my life that these two beautiful bald men can help me out? I'm not bald. It's a preemptive strike. I have hair. It's just <laughs> <laughs> um, preemptive strike. <laughs> um, that's such an important point, not the bald part, but the. Um, that this is not esoteric, right? Like, how do I show up as a king in my marriage? How do I show up as a king in my business? How do I show up a king with my aging parents, treating the king and queen, right, who are still the king and queen, that maybe, you know, my emperor and empress at this point, and, like, honor them while still making choices on their behalf. So there's so many different ways to apply this. I, I think that that's a great point. Yeah. And, and I think that's really the trick is please, when, when you get done listening to us, go apply it. And if you can't apply it, you know, B and I would love to be here to help you as well as our lovely uh, partner, Dr. Elise. You can find out more about what all of us are doing. Start at the meaning academy.com. You want to chat with B def defiant spirit.org, correct B or is it .com? All right. DefianceSpirit.org. I'm at DanielAFrans.com, and you can check out the other project at PurposefulTransition.com. And just just kind of a side note on that, as B and Elise and I continue to work on these projects, know that it's our goal to eventually bring these on, all together under the roof of the Meaning Academy. So you should definitely be looking at that. We have our individual products. We are individuals. That's what we've been doing for years. But as we grow this group, this academy. Um, definitely things to be looking for. And if you enjoy this podcast and all of our podcasts and the work that we, we do, keep seeing what's coming up because, uh, you know, our part of transitioning from prince to king and, and being self-transcendent is to put this out there and continue to help in whatever ways we can. That's right. And if you didn't enjoy the podcast, send Dr. Dan an email. So, that <laughs> <note>. <laughs> <laughs> all right brother i hope your internet improves it was great to connect with you and it looks like a lovely day so go enjoy it outstanding in the meantime live your life with meaning purpose and resilience take care everybody take care